We welcome you all to the book discussion of Awakening Bharat Mata, the political beliefs of the Indian right. The Bharat Book Club, an initiative of Historical India, is a forum for students and scholars to share an enthusiasm for readership and deliberation of ideas. Based out of the University of Delhi, the club aims at reviving the culture of reading and research in universities. From hosting book launches to introducing and reintroducing literature, publishing reviews, enhancing bibliographic research, to initiating novel bibliophile endeavors, these characterize the essence of the Bharat Book Club. Historical India is a community-based digital wiki platform stimulating an exclusive discourse on multidisciplinary history. It's a platform where one can create and edit wiki articles, ensuring that this discourse reaches the masses by tracking the dynamics of search engine optimization. Almost one third articles at Historical India appear in the top five searches in various search engines. It also aims to serve as a platform for historical deliberation beyond the digital space. Today, we are deeply honored to have with us an uh, eminent journalist and Rajya Sabha, former member of parliament, Swapan Das Gupta Ji. Swapan. Swapanji received the prestigious Padma Bhushan Award in 2015. He completed his graduation from St. Stephen's College and thereafter went on to earn an MA and PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He is a journalist by profession and served as an editor in various national newspapers like The Statesman, Times of India and The Indian Express. He is a leading figure in the field of Hindu nationalism and contributed comprehensively to the research work on the Hindu right. Through the present book, he deconstructs Hindu right as a social and political movement that started around 300 years ago. So, uh, now I request uh, members of the Bharat Book Club, Vikas Ji and Kanita Ji, to come on the stage and moderate the session with the author. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I request one of our volunteers to please come on stage and, uh, and uh, hand over a minute to, to uh, Sapanji from Sai Dutti Pash. Anji, sir, come on stage. Where is your intellectual establishment? If you are criticizing JNU, 
where is your journey? So, sir, essentially my question is that whether the right has really suffered from some intellectual deficit or is it because of the political suppression by the state or on one hand and the political confidence given by the state to the left over the years? Uh, that's my question. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, thank Bharat Book Club actually for inviting me to this <coughs> gathering. Uh, it's a very long question, extremely long question. Uh, what I'll do is I'll tell you why I started writing this book. Over the years, especially when you are engaging with people of a particular generation, you often found that there was a very facile view which said that all intellectual wisdom was deposited in the left alone. There was a common belief and that's a belief which wasn't confined to JNU. It was a belief which I have seen in a lot of Western universities. From which JNU derives its inspiration? I have found it in parts of Delhi University. It existed in a smaller way when I was a student in the 70s, but I think it's increased quite a lot. And there was a belief that anybody who was not of the left, and I hesitate to use the term right, although the publisher said hey, this is a convenient shorthand, people understand the word, so use it. Okay. They often equated the what might be called the right to being a part of the stupid club. And that's not my that was an expression which was used for the conservatives in Britain in the 19th century. That they were stupid, inherently. So all those who were not intellectual, all those who never thought about it, instinctively went around like cattle, like herd, and went into the right. Or that the right was people who were just full of prejudices. Now, when it came to India, I often heard, you know, during cricket matches, when India is doing well, which it didn't do yesterday, but when India is doing rather well in cricket, you'll find that the, as the tempo rises, and as you reach a certain climax, the shouts of India, India, India often merge with Bharat Mata Ki You find that. And I heard some left people criticizing me saying, Yeh Bharat Mata Ki Jai, what is this? Yeh can't say. Now, to therefore, where did this idea of Bharat Mata come in? To today, Bharat Mata, there are even Bharat Mata Pujas in various parts, all over the country. No fixed time for it. Sometimes they are held in 15th August, sometimes they are held in 26th January, sometimes they are held any time. Now, the I, and people would often say, India was never a nation. This is all connected, all these ideas are all connected. India was never a nation. India, Churchill once said, India is much of a nation as the equator. So this idea that here is a, just a cluster of peoples without any commonality who were united basically by the British Empire. Because the British Empire more or less ruled most parts of India, not every part, and from there. So it, and, but mind you, these ideas that India is not a nation, India, that, uh, what 
this Bharat Mata, etc., etc., are all very recent ideas. You go back 100 years, <coughs> the situation is very different. The idea of Bharat Mata was basically, it's a modern invention. That India, your motherland, as something of a goddess. And it was put into political language by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee in Vande Matra. Now if you read the whole of the Vande Matra, not the one verse which is popularized, there's a whole history behind why only one verse was allowed to pass uh, muster. You'll find that all of these ideas have a deep history. And it's very intimately connected with our freedom movement. And some of these ideas actually take root even before the freedom movement. So it was necessary to actually point out, and I'm coming back to the question of why I wrote this book, why I made this collection is for people to understand that there is a longer history, that there are deeper roots, and what, and that these roots have a very solid intellectual pedigree, and that lots of people wrote about them in the past, and that it's our that today we seem to have obliterated all of them from our consciousness. Whether we go back to Bankim Chandra, whether we talk about Swami Vivekananda, whether we go to Aurobindo, from there onwards you, you can trace at every point how these ideas are gradually coming into focus. And right, even in the historical writings, Till about the 1950s, when someone like Radha Kumar Mukherjee wrote, he gave a lecture in 1920s in the University of Mysore on the fundamental unity of India. And he traced how this idea of India, now today some people call it a sacred geography. There's a term which is Dan Egg, for instance. Harvard scholar who said she didn't want to write the book. She wanted to write it but she delayed publication because she felt that this would influence the political discourse. Of course it would. So the idea of India as a sacred geography, the India as a living entity, the India, the nationhood of India as opposed to the state of India. And I think this is a very important Distinction which we must make, and any anybody who is even a first year student of political science would know what the basic difference is. That India probably lacked a single statehood. Sometime, occasionally, there was a united. But by and large, the idea of nation was always there. That the idea of they felt themselves to be Bharatiya. Or they saw themselves as Hindustan. Whichever the length of the term which may have that, that, that's a later Persian term which we gave And this, the idea of this book was that. That to trace the political lineage of the past and link it to the politics of the and link it to some of the debates of the day, the connection. So it is to actually apprise a subsequent generation for whom the new history, which is a sort of a neo-Marxist history, has obliterated this. That what we are I wanted to say also that what I am saying is not something fundamentally original. It has all been said before. And it is for us to just unearth those 
and see the continuities in our thought process. That.
the belief in the sacred that your land is sacred in some ways and this is not again very you go back to the native indians of north america or you go to some of our one washi population we will see this hill is sacred the entire geography of india there is a there is a geography of the ramayana for instance you go to various parts they say bhai yahan aisa hua yes sab jo hai chhota chhota folklore hai oh mahabharat the pandav state here the you know or ye ye hua hua tha that's someone should actually map this thing the number of stories which exist all over india so there is the notion of the secret which is very much part of, of, of this then you have what is called the belief in the national identity some people say oh we are patriotic but we are not nationalist this is a very fashionable thing to say these days some TV anchor specialized in this. <laughs> But we are nationalists. We believe in the integrity of the nation state. We believe in the integrity of India. So patriotism, of course, is there. Patriotism is a very, you know, like the geography. You like, it's a bit of a tourist. Fundamentally, one of these things 
थोड़ा बहुत हम लोग स्मृति से काम किया बट देखो इन टर्म्स ऑफ द ट्रांसमिशन ऑफ आर हेरिटेज we left too many loopholes and we were never prepared for the political and the other disruptions which took place in our society for about 1000 years each time there was a disruption some tradition would disappear it was not merely the destruction of nalanda bai bhakti akhil ji But yesterday I read it. Actually, had no. Some new historians have come out and said it has had no impact. Just, but the so this is the point. So when Al Al Baruni wrote in the 11th century that Hindus have no sense of history, he meant a couple of things. Firstly, we also had a rather lax view of chronology. We looked upon things as Jew, a Kaliyug. So the precise nature of chronology, which is part of modern history, is also something which we know. So these were certain lacunae which affected us, which affected our evolution as people. Which is why sometimes when we, you know, one of the uh, one of the first things which you have to look at in history. That if you look at modern history, you are going almost entirely by the written word. Who controlled the written word? When you are talking about you know the biases in history, why do the biases come? Because you are dependent almost entirely on archives, and you have to go to work. Problem with some of the Marxists is they don't even go to the archives. You go to the archives, but in the archives you are finding one second type of documents. The other type of documents were never recorded. Our folklore se kuch baat kar sakte hain. When I was doing some research on the jungle mahals of West Bengal. You have to depend quite a lot to understand the mind of these people. You have to look at folklore. You have to look, look at songs to complement what was there in the archives. Otherwise, archives were the ex ex administrative reports were there. Some of those people wrote very good administrative reports. Both are true, but they wrote it from their perspective. So we have suffered quite particularly a lot of this. Today, when did you know a thing that till about 150 years ago, nobody in India had forgotten. I mean, India had forgotten the Shoka. It was by chance discovered by a British archaeologist. Can you tell me this? So much reliance on is one of the earliest Indian tracts on statecraft. It was discovered by chance in a place in Kerala. Now, how much more is yet to be discovered, and how much more has been destroyed? Just like we know that Megasthenes is Indica. Is never the original has never been found. We found it through Plutarch, through this, that, and the other. So likewise, we are still piecing together our past in a conscious way, and that project is enormously important. And we are just about beginning. Was 
sought to be wiped out from our own minds. So it is recovering ourselves, recovering our integrity, which is so important. And that requires a certain aptitude. It's a, it's a serious study, it's a scholarly pursuit which we have to engage. Some people, you know, the study of the ancient languages has to be taken up far more seriously. Archaeology at one time was a very important subject. It's no longer. Yesterday I was with some Iranian delegation in Lucknow who come from Iran and they said that the basic, what is called Old Persian, you know, there is Old Persian, Middle Persian and Modern Persian. Three types of languages in the The Old Persian was essentially Sanskrit. That the Zendavastha is essentially Sanskrit in its structure. Now, how many scholars of Old Persian is there in India? We have lost this tradition. And therefore, this is a very serious issue which I am actually raising. That how the devastation which has been caused in our education system, in our political thinking, by this neglect, and why it's so important for the universities, for scholars and all to realize and they will only do this once they realize why they are doing it. There has to be a certain purpose. People study computers, why? Because they think, right, there are some prospects. So, to motivate people, you have to give them the reason. <laughs> and that reasoning is to and, and to my mind, so this is, I see it as an intellectual project. I see it as a nation building project. I see it as a recovery of our inheritance project. This, it's, it's actually a project in archaeology. There is so much which has been forgotten, which is too much underneath the surface. If we can get back some of them. Oh, Haryana mein jo Saraswati civilization ka jo excavations chal raha hai. It is a bit like that. We are discovering things and we have to do it. So it's interesting that you mentioned the difference between the nation and the state. And uh, I have actually encountered many people who uh, say that India was never a nation and it was created in 1947 and India is still in the nation uh, making process. So uh, it's just that we have to recommend the, the book Fundamental Unity of India by Radha Kovind Mukherjee. So now my question is uh, related to uh, politics. That sir, in 1980, as you mentioned in the book, uh, BJP uh, was formed and it adopted Gandhian socialism as its essential principle. Sir, at that time, L.K. Advani gave an interview in which he said that an ideology can come into power only in a small area. The ideology, a party can come into power in a small territory. But sir, how far do you think that this is true in the current dynamics where politics is largely driven by our ideology? How far has Hindutva able, able to translate across all the states and create an all-encompassing nature which is also converted into electoral favors? When we talk about ideology, we must be very clear about what we are talking about. You see, if we are talking about ideology as a doctrine, as a written doctrine, then you have problems. Then you have serious problems. One of my biggest problems with Savarkar's definition of Hindutva was that Savarkar tried to codify it. He said, you need this, you need this, you need this to be this is what it is. Hindutva is a sentiment. It's a bhavna. If you try and say, ki bhavna mein 
ये होना चाहिए ये होना चाहिए ये नहीं होना चाहिए
And Gandhiji also knew the importance of being a Hindu. Sir, it's interesting uh, that you point out about uh, Gandhi and even if we read a uh, Hindu Suraj, so we we'll find that Gandhi even uh, mentioned that India was a nation before uh, you know 1947 and it was uh, spiritually connected to the uh, pilgrimage and the other the establishment of temples across the uh, landscape. The sacred geography issue. Yes. You know, we, we are connected everywhere. The dhams, the pilgrimage routes that established, I mean, these have been going on for centuries. I mean, I can find my some sort of ancestry if I go to Haridwar. Which person in my family came how many hundred years ago? They'll be able to look at it. Of course, they'll find it in Puri or Paranasi also. But similarly, you have these sort of and which is why this whole concept of an integrated system was very, very much there. So when you're talking about ideology, you see there are two different things which we're talking about. One is a certain mooring which guides you, a certain broader commitment, which is good to, to the nation. Now which specific policy you need at specific junctures, now tell me, how to fight COVID is that ideology? But it's a very important part of politics. Because you had two different things. One is of course how to develop the importance that you said that no, no, we must try and develop an indigenous vaccine. That means you had a certain political orientation. Rather than depend on Pfizer, that's a, well, number one. Number two, you had certain Nobel laureates who said there has been a lot of disruption. Distribute cash to everyone. We didn't go for that strategy. Those who went in for that strategy today are having inflation of an un unthinkable nature which they cannot cope with. Take the case of the United States as one. Well. United Kingdom is another one and of course they never anticipated the energy crisis so but they created the groundwork for it. We would have been another Sri Lanka or something if we had done that. We are not. We are in a far energy situation. So those were political choices which were made and those are political choices which were made on the strength of what? The belief that you have to advance in a fundamental commitment that you need to advance in certain direction. So never treat ideology as you know like Marxist Communist Manifesto or some people will say Lenin said what is to be done and you know various tracts here and there and they'll always say Marx himself said. So, I don't know who else can say. So there is a fundamental difference I am not one person who believes that it's, you know, it's cast in stone, etc. So, yeah. yes, sir, now we would uh, open the floor for the audience questions. Uh, yes, sir, please. Good evening, sir. This was, uh, I was just listening to you, but I've been waiting to ask you this since long. I've been reading your work, your columns, uh, editorials, I'm working with you. Sir, when you start Lahal Smarta Ki Jai, so Michael Bailey in his work, 1993, Banal Nationalism, quotes that there's a... Uh, Who quotes, sorry? Michael Bailey in his work, Banal Nationalism, because I want, I'm asking this because as a student of nationalism, when we are writing or when we are reading, there's always a debate, as he also asks, that either you align with the primordialist view of nationalism, that nation and state, the debate between nation state, or a modernist view, or some say that it is a subject of class or something. But how do you, or how do you as a scholar, eminent scholar, advise us who are voting and writing to align with the idea of nation? Like we imagine it symbolically, or we imagine it in history, 
or we also align with it when we are imagining our nation. How do we imagine our nation? How do we imagine or how do we align to this idea of Bharat Mata? Or like how do we write it, categorize it in our uh, works? Because we are also working and we also want to write much on the nation and the concept of state. So this contradiction comes up as a scholar or as a learner, as a teacher in the class. So how do you suggest, because no one better than you can suggest us on this. Thank you, sir. See, every nation needs a symbol. That's the important thing. The idea of Bharat Mata was actually popularized, but may have been created as a symbol. That's the important thing. The idea of Bharat Mata was actually popularized, but may have been created as a result of Bandi Mata. But it was actually conceptualized and popularized by Shri Aurobindo. He did that. And he would, he may have had ideas which are there. For instance, in, in France you have the notion of magic. You have Mother Russia. You have concepts like these almost everywhere in other established societies, in some form or the other. A ruling date, a, a governing date, some symbol. So the symbol part, the symbolic part is very much there. We all need symbols. And everybody, and symbol, symbolism of what India is, is, is encapsulated there. The original Bharat Mata drawing was by Abhinipra But that which has become popularized is really an offshoot of a Ravi Varma sort of I mean, it's calendar art. But this, this Now, the India is not made in, in terms of creating a nation. We had, we have had a nation. An idea of Bharatiyata was there in any way. It was expressed differently, sometimes nebulously. May not be even consciously created, which may be inherited. Which we've inherited, we've added, we've subtracted, whatever it is, we've enlarged the scope of the state. Sometimes we can contract the role of the state also. That's a negotiable thing, which is really part of politics. How much of the state do you want? When someone says it is not the business of government to, to be in business, they mean that the, the state must necessarily contract. And when someone says that it's the nature of government to actually provide for everybody, you're talking about an expansion of the state. And today with technology, we've expanded the state. We've also added the notion of efficiency into the whole thing. Indira Gandhi also thought of, you know, how much to give to this person, that person, this person. But it all went on leakages. Today with various technology, we can actually ensure that at least 90-95% of it gets to the intended recipient. So the role of the state gets enlarged, the state gets a certain legitimacy. So the state expansion has been continuing in India since 1947 or even before that. The feeling of nationhood assumes different forms at different times. When we have things like the Ranga Yantra, when we have the nature how 75 years of independence is celebrated, these are all attempts to make nationhood more relevant and give an emotional thrust. So ultimately nationhood comes from there. You can't say this is the objective criteria in language on a you know the whole bunch of that. The Treaty of Westphalia, whatever they did, that sort of nation. But that model will not work in India because we are not a nation in that sense of the term. We fail those tests and yet we are a nation. So
So we have to look ourselves as a civilization. Now, the problem of saying civilizational, as I often realize, when you talk about the fact that we are a civilization, and you, you talk like this in uh, Bangladesh, and you talk like this in uh, Sri Lanka, they assume that you are about to grab them. So how do we also, therefore the challenge is, how do we enlarge India's civilizational reach. Sometimes the nation and civilization has to be used a little together and a little differently. How do we integrate the footprint of Indian civilization without enlarging the Indian state to embrace that? You mentioned about the state is expanding to more efficient government and the idea. Sir, I just read the book uh, the Ideology of India's Modern Right by Subramanian Swami. There, there he had mentioned. I haven't read it. <laughs> there he had mentioned something called Dharmic government. So, what do you think of this idea? Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> How, like you mentioned, it's the uh, more than just uh, disillusionment with uh, the opposition territory. Uh, it was a civilizational aspiration since the independence of the people of India. But you know, a governance that, like uh, Vikas mentioned, of a dharmic governance is what I'm guessing uh, people presume the current uh, administration to be. So, my question is uh, this book uh, was written before the 2019 election. And um, thus, it has a very ubiquitous view of the same. And as he, uh, you know, see, I mean, the idea of dharma is very much there. What does it basically? It basically delineates the right and the wrong, the just and the unjust. This is the idea of dharma. And we have various views to when we say ye tumara dharma hai. We mean that. That's it. It's also duty to some extent. It's your obligation. It's a, it's a combination of so many different impulses, not one impulse really. It's not really Krishna telling Arjun why he must fight the battle. It's not merely that. That is only one aspect. So the idea of dharma is actually quite all pervasive in our society. It then basically means to say a moral society where we have certain values in ingrained in us. And that should be the ob object of all politics as far as possible. As far as possible is what I say. <coughs> because in reality, sometimes it is not possible to keep up with such lofty ideas. <coughs> but elections, yes, you know, however much we wanted to be uh, a battle between dharma and adharma, it is a little more complicated than that. India, that is Bharat, Union of the State. We have not been able to do that our country will be the name of India and Bharat will be the name of India. This was a different country that could not be able to do the name of our country. जिसने हमें गुलाम बनाया, जिसने मेरा दमन किया, उसी के लिए हुए नाम को मैंने स्वीकार कर लिया। आज जहाँ भी फोन करता हूँ, जहाँ भी मुझे भी आप यहाँ दो भारत लव और भारत माता देखने को मिल रहा है, लेकिन हर जगह ही दिया, विश्व मंच पे ही दिया। तो क्या भारत का कोई अस्तित्व नहीं था, उसके नाम जब अपने भारत माता के चित्र दिया है ना अपने पुस्तक पे आज भी जब अपने भारत माता को मैं देखता हूँ तो मैं यही देख पाता हूँ कि इसकी चंगाएं सलामत हैं लेकिन आज भी इसकी भूंगाएं भुजाएं इसके पास नहीं हैं आज भी इसके भुजाओं में दो बलशाली छेद हैं अटल जी की उपांति थी कि कैसे उल्लास It was a very uh, impassioned intervention. It was not a question. It was 
certain observation, but I can tell you something. I, I, I'm getting the essence of what you're saying. For about 200 years, the meal, if you go back into all the Indian thinkers who wrote right from the middle of the 19th century, from about the 1820s, 1830s onwards. They had only one question. Their main preoccupation. Bharat kyu paradin ko? If my Hindi is a bit suspect, I'm basically translating from Bengali. But Bharat keno paradin ko? Why did we lose our national sovereignty? That was the question which they constantly posed in different ways. They came up with different answers. <coughs> Everybody, whether they were conservatives, whether they were liberal, whether they were radicals, whether they were Nanade, they were Bhandarka, they were Stila, they were Kupal Vishnabokri, all of them, Vivekananda. All of them asked this simple question. And they came to some conclusions which are not very different from what That Hamara Atma Samman has been, we've lost our self respect. We've lost our backbone. Whether to make this a priority at present is another matter altogether. 